Okay, perfect. Well, this is a really sweet option that um, we've been incorporating into some of our programming, some of our presentations. Um, this is one thing that we really have been trying to get a handle of, handle to get in control over for so long now is all of the questions. And I really would like to be able to answer all of the questions. Sometimes there's not enough time during the presentation. So with the uh, posted video, I always want there to be um, an option or opportunity to have your questions answered. So I'm revisiting the questions. We recorded them uh, and the, the team has put them all down uh, for me and I'm going to work through them. So if you had questions that were not answered during the presentation, uh, hopefully we'll be able to get to it now. Uh, so the first one uh, would was, uh, well, I thought it was a really cool question. Um, I think I remember seeing it come in too, but is Hazelwood uh, similar to prickly ash? Is prickly ash effective on muscular pain like back and neck and oral pain? So that one's really cool. Um, they are uh, not similar at all. They, they don't share any of the same chemistry or mechanisms uh, whatsoever. Um, the prickly ash um, does nothing for m muscular pain. <laughs> uh, it only works with the mouth. So, so in some of the studies, they uh, took the saponin that is absorbed sublingually that um, draws calcium from sensory neurons in the mouth and applied that same saponin to, well, it is applied, you know, when it's, a, when it's, because it's absorbed sublingually, it's in your blood, that saponin is applied to every uh, um, sensory neuron that, that, that it can possibly be exposed to, and nothing happens, only in the mouth, it only does something in the mouth, and it's really amazing looking at plants, and our connection to them, or, you know, the, this, the, the whole story of our bodies being formed from them, uh, and in understanding that connection and our potential for restoration there, um, the, the parts of our body that were, that were formed from those particular plants, they only help with that part. <laughs> uh, like uh, only the lung medicine is going to help with uh, the lungs and only uh, nerve medicine is going to help with the nerves. And and um, and so with the prickly ash, you apply that sapin into any other sensory neuron. It does absolutely nothing. But in the mouth, uh, immediately sucks out the calcium and seems to establish uh, like a shunting mechanism to prevent re-inoculation of calcium for an extended period of time so teething babies sometimes can have two or three days before they start to ask for that medicine again which is pretty remarkable um so um so i hope that answers that hazelwood is, is definitely a lot a, a lot different and and um just in my experience a, a lot less effective um uh, especially when you're comparing sort of the teething necklace sort of style and and then the uh the resin necklace is is just not not even a part of the same conversation uh it really um not, not not capable of too much uh therapy though the idea is there the idea is nice uh it's just um uh and, and yeah i know i'm biased talking about you know but just the realities of a lot of the different medicinal plants from the Great Lakes region forming this whole industry that we rely on. Uh, it's really, really incredible. Um, but yeah, it's very focused on the mouth and, uh, and a lot more effective than, than Hazelwood. Uh, how do you respect the plant nation when you're harvesting these plants is another question. Uh, and I think I kind of answered that, that a little bit, um, but I think how you respect anything is by education, <laughs> by learning, doing what doing what you need to do to be able to learn, to be able to make the appropriate action, to be able to make an appropriate decision uh, that requires a tremendous amount of education. And so um, the when when working with uh, 
yeah any nation but so for the plant nation it's the same thing you know you you want to be a part of this process you want to go and get all of these different types of plants you want this to be a part of your life you know there's something special about it um and uh so sometimes you know i'll tell people to just chillax a little bit uh at least in the beginning because when you understand this process and you understand plants that are indigenous to the Great Lakes and what they have been responsible for and uh, and you get your first few experiences, first few or first authentic experience with it, uh, like um, with the tamarack bark and is one of my favorites in in removing any sign of neuropathy or taking somebody who has diabetic neuropathy no feeling in their feet and in three hours that after the prick test have sensation throughout their entire foot like that's an experience and after that experience you're gonna know that there is something special or having a bunch of labrador tea everybody walks out of that room clinically free of diabetes at the end of the day and after three months, uh, you know, we get their A1Cs and we're able to remove that diagnosis. Uh, those are really, really tremendously powerful experiences. And uh, I think that those experiences are what's going to really generate an authentic education that is going to be able to generate a, a really authentic sort of form of respect for that plant world. Um so it's sort of like a two-part answer, I guess. Uh, education is really important, and uh, of course. And then also just the, um, uh, the, those experiences are important as well. When you get those experiences, you're just going to, uh, it just takes it to a whole other level. Because after that, you know, and you're going to look at that plant differently. You're going to gesture out into the entire forest differently. Um, and, and that's going to really drive your education and, and grow the respect that you're capable of. Uh, I hope that answers that question. Um, <clears throat> the medicine for, what is the medicine for diabetes? The medicine for diabetes is, uh, well, there's a lot, um, one of the things that I'm going to do for, for these, some of these questions is I have uh, some private YouTube links that, uh, that I could send out for that have further information on all of these topics. Like we have uh, an eight hour series. It was actually almost 20 hours in total, but that we dedicated to uh, diabetes. And so we will be able to link out to some of those videos um <clears throat> somehow <laughs> but anyways the medicines for diabetes are generally um the main one is going to be labrador tea <laughs> the main one is going to be labrador tea i just pet my dog a bunch of hair everywhere <laughs> uh but labrador tea is rhododendron grown landicum um shkigavak and it is the main the main help for diabetes uh, it's amazing sort of the if i could just say really quickly the the way that it works is that it is a um it addresses the real root problem of metabolic disease where metabolic disease begins is at insulin resistance in the muscle insulin resistance begins at in all different tissues at all different stages and it begins in the muscle uh, and it's only detectable and treatable when insulin resistance spreads into the liver that's when that's when we usually need to we can see fasting insulin fasting glucose uh, postprandial glucose uh, rise uh, and so that's when it needs to be medicated, but the disease really begins in the muscle. Uh, your muscles are the primary site for glucose disposal. Over 85% of the, over 80% of the sugar that you eat is, uh, disposed of in the muscles. And if the muscles are insulin resistant, they the uptake of glucose into the muscle is, is impaired. And then also the ability to utilize the sugar that's in the muscle is impaired. So 
you lost your ability to utilize your number one site for glucose disposal, so you need insulin to bring it down. The way that it brings it down at that point is um, your is is it is it forces the sugar into other cells in your body like endothelial cells, mesangial cells, nerve cells, eyes. This is why when we have diabetes, we get nerve damage, kidney damage, eye problems, uh, and blood vessel problems. So um, if we give our muscles the ability to utilize sugar again, um, we're really getting at the root problem. That's exactly what Labrador T does, increasing GLUT4 uh, transportation of glucose into the muscle, muscular tissue and, uh, uh, you know, modifying and nutrient sensing pathways like AMP kinase to be able to utilize the sugar um, uh, in, in the muscle tissue. And so uh, you're able to control your blood sugar outside of insulin. Small walks after dinner, moving throughout the day, suddenly become extremely effective and uh, has tremendous effect on uh, a huge measurable effect on A1Cs. Like you get people in three months later and it's like, it's insane. Uh, so we, we utilize that one. And uh, so I'll share some links uh, with the team so that we're able to get some of these to you. So you're able to watch sort of more full length presentations if, if you're really interested. Um, so here's another question. I know some herbal medicines can interact with Western medicine pharmaceuticals. Uh, many of the clients I see at Six Nations are taking many medications for various health conditions. So can something like pitcher plant be used safely in combination with other medications and treatments? So specifically, pitcher plant, um, well, you could think about it for yourself too. I and mean, this is why this is one of the things that we cover, like we treat or teach in pharmacology and toxicology courses all over Ontario. And this is a really simple question to think about. Um, what we need to understand is plant mechanism of action to be able to make these decisions as healthcare professionals. Um, not, the, not, that, not that I'm one, um, um, at least qualified one in, in that way. But um, if, you, if we learn and understand plant mechanism, then we can measure uh, and understand potential contraindication. So maybe I, we could even do this as a little bit of an exercise. So pitcher plant, the mechanism of it is there are saponins, again, which are absorbed sublingually, again. So this is one of my favorite sort of wizard medicine plants that I, you know, I could put in somebody's lip and in, in minutes they're standing straight for the first time in 20 years because of the, the pain relief that they have. So those saponins are... It's basically the same thing in your mouth, right? But with the prickly ash, but these ones draw out the calcium from every sensory neuron in your, oops, uh, from every sensory neuron in your spine, uh, and so uh, the pain relief in your spine is is, is super fast. But the uh, the repair uh, it also inhibits the toxic effects of glucose on the nerve cells, uh, so that the sciatic nerve is actually able to repair. Um, they did some really amazing studies which are like real horrible every time I read about them, poor rats, but they completely severed the sciatic nerve of rats um, and exposed them to outrageous amounts of a known neurotoxin, glucose. <laughs> uh, so we know that nerve tissue is not able to heal in the presence of glucose. So they just filled these rats up with uh, a really sugar rich diet and then exposed them to the saponins that are, I think there was like eight of them in total uh, from the pitcher plant that I think they made them synthetically even. Um, this is in the pursuit of trying to make a drug for uh, sciatica. But anyways, um, they, in, they gave them the, the medicine and it was so great. It's it at inhibiting the toxic effects of glucose on nerve tissue that the completely severed nerve was it was able to just reattach, refuse, uh, and within days, a completely severed sciatic nerve was was symptom free, uh, in the presence of the uh, greatest insult to nerves being able to heal glucose. Uh, so that was really cool. And so just the, in, in the process of this medicine working, um, it's not doing anything really, cr really crazy. You know, it's inhibiting the toxic effects of glucose. It's allowing that nerve 
uh, to live, repair, and regenerate in the presence of a known insult. And so it's not really doing anything uh, um, really un unusual. I mean, the only thing is that it's probably going to be uh, or definitely will be limiting the amount of glucose that insulin is able to shove inside of nerves, um, which it, which is one of the primary functions of insulin uh, to low to well w one of the who probably thousands of functions of insulin um, to be able to send the sugar into the nerve tissue to in effort to lower your blood sugar and consequently cause damage to nerve tissue, hence diabetic neuropathy or diabetes-induced um, sciatica. Um, and so maybe there's just a little bit less sugar that is able to be sent into your nerves. So you, maybe your sugar is going to stay a little elevated in a diabetic, but uh, this tissue is going to be able to heal, heal. And then you kind of like risk management this situation and say, okay, well, say the worst thing that this plant can do is uh, um, limit the body's ability to control blood sugar because you're losing one of the primary sites, nerves, for glucose disposal. And, and so say the sugar is staying slightly elevated, but say, you know, mobility is an issue, that it is sciatica that is preventing the diabetic from being able to engage in, in like uh, small amounts of exercise every day. So, you know, risk management. <laughs> uh, so I guess in short, though, I could have just said that it, there's no contraindication. Uh, with pitcher plant and e even with other pain medications, um, it's able to do what pain medication, what we wish pain man pain medication did. Uh, pain management is one of my favorite subjects to talk about ever. <laughs> uh, I, I, I love it so much, and uh, because the role that medicine has in pain management is super simple, and it it just like always does just what it's supposed to do. And it's really, really incredible. Um, I, so I hope I answered that question. Uh, but here's number eight. Uh, is there a resource that can help to provide knowledge about interactions of traditional and Western medicine? Um, no. <laughs> no, this was actually probably, was actually, is actually probably going to be one of my first resources. Um, uh, because it is one of the biggest barriers to preventing access to indigenous healthcare and uh, I think if there was a reliable resource for us to be able to use for uh, and then to be, you know, disseminated, I, I really um, uh, uh, probably, you know, that would be probably one of the most important and most impactful uh, resources to be written. But as far as I know, it's, it's not. It's, it's kind of like, a, and in all of the work that we do, just leave it into the hands of the healthcare professional to... Um, you know, sorry, but do more research <laughs> and, uh, um, and, you know, that being one of our primary jobs is to, uh, teach plant mechanism of action, plant physiological effects of plant chemistry, exactly what they're doing inside of the body and be able to create these risk management and, uh, um, uh, sort of cases and these one of the reasons why we're brought into all these different pharmacology and toxicology courses across the province is because um, it's really fun too and uh, um, but yeah there's there's no no re resources other than just independent research just consulting with the literature yourself um, and my process for this has been just simply understanding plant mechanisms um, and, and taking some of and all of the most common, uh, at least, uh, prescription medication used in indigenous communities, sort of looking at that epidemiology and um, seeing if there was any major sort of contraindications there and uh, in our work with pharmacology and toxicology courses in Ontario, um, some students have been able to bring some really amazing uh, 
not case studies, but Im imaginary situations uh, really having to make us think and just understanding that plant mechanism, uh, the physiological effect of plant chemistry uh, and understanding plant chemistry is what's really going to be the most important at the end of the day. Uh, and so dedication to that study is super important. Um, so question number nine, I hope I answered that question. Um, question number nine here, um, iron deficiency in women. I'm hearing that many women, even those who are meat eaters, are experiencing this. Can ironwood tea help? So ironwood tea wouldn't be my first uh, choice. It can be a really horrible tasting tea <laughs> too, especially if you're doing it properly. If you make ironwood tea and you're like, hmm, it's probably something wrong. <laughs> That's supposed to be brutal, uh, boring out the black heartwood of ironwood, which is very dangerous too. <laughs> but uh, making tea with that, it's it's got a flavor. Um. But yeah, the uh, um, iron deficiency in women, I think that um, I, I don't, I don't want to overgeneralize, but um, I think, I don't think that just, yeah, well, we have a separation from, you know, organ meats where, whereas 100 years ago, like, that was the part of the animal that was the most treasured was organ meats. Uh, like we would give the steaks to the dogs and we would get, we would eat the organ meat. So this is consistent across the continent uh, that the organs were the most important and most, most valuable parts of the animal. And they're not now it's the complete opposite. You go to the supermarket or you go to get groceries, you, you get, you get steaks and uh, you get organ meats for your dogs. <laughs> um, and so, um, I mean, there is that, but I think that one of the big issues with uh, iron deficiencies uh, is not the amount of meat that's being consumed. I think that, uh, uh, or even the amount of organs that's being consumed. Uh, I think that the main problem is, is uh, the, the amount of carbohydrates that are consumed and the amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids that are being consumed, vegetable oils, are um are a really incredible uh um i don't know how to say like source of uh this kind of imbalance yeah there are just um so many reasons why vegetable oil is uh, probably one of the worst things that we could ever put in our body first of all brand new to our species they were only developed less than 100 years ago um, and directly correlate with so many issues, including iron absorption. Uh, but so, so there is the issue of vegetable seed oils like canola, cotton seed, rape seed, grape seed, soybean, all of these probably um, being one of the primary driving forces of iron, uh, inhibiting iron absorption. But also to just the, just this overconsumption of plant foods. Um, there are so many different types of plant toxins, um, mainly, well, like spinach. We'll take spinach into consideration. I don't want to get too lost in, in the weeds here, but like you take spinach, uh, which is a, a dark leafy green that is known for having huge amounts of iron. It's non-heme iron, uh, so non-usable by the human body, but uh, we could convert it. And so it's subject to a really dismal conversion ratio um which i think yeah is about 15 percent um and of the non-heme iron that that is actually convertible to heme iron uh but then what you also have to take into consideration is the plant toxins that are inside of the spinach like oxalates uh, spinach being one of the primary sources of oxalates and oxalic acid which impede directly your ability to absorb iron so i mean you could guarantee from spinach that you're actually not going to be getting any of the iron from from that food source and so um uh excessive carbohydrates and 
um, are, are, and so excessive carbohydrates, um, over inundation of various plant toxins, phytic acid, uh, oxalates and uh, salicylates and things like that, uh, inhibiting iron absorption, and then as well vegetable oils and m m more of the metabolites of vegetable oil, like uh, uh, they're called oxlams, like 4-H&E is probably the most common um, metabolite of vegetable oils uh, that will <laughs> directly and very powerfully inhibit your body's ability to absorb iron and so um, we actually don't even use medicine. Uh, I mean, the, the medicine that we would use is Tamarack, but, um, and it does help, um, Tamarack bark tea. But really, though, like we get somebody getting their carbohydrate intake like below 200 grams a day, which is very doable for most people. Um, throw the vegetable oil out and uh, limit the amount, uh, understand like, the spectrum of plant toxicity and engage in the least toxic plants uh, that are known to have the least amount of um, these plant chemicals that inhibit the absorption of iron. And more often than not, we don't even have to look to medicine. And so I think that that is, you know, to a question earlier, one of the most respectful things that you could ever do for plants is uh, to really get at the root of the problem and say, yeah, I don't need medicine for diabetes. I mean, maybe what I need to start doing is stop having over 500 grams of carbohydrates a day. Um, then you don't even need the medicine. Uh, of course, it's, it's the hardest thing in the world is to change somebody's eating habits. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, I mean, tamarack bark is uh, is a pretty solid option, and you're gonna see uh, you're gonna see that rise immediately. Uh, though the results are not going to be that spectacular, but they will always be trending in the right direction. <laughs> Upon elimination of all of those other things that I mentioned, uh, it will be very striking, um, and the quality of life is is uh, is, is really awesome. Whew, I better start hammering through these. Uh, is there any way we can book some time to gather medicines with you? <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe in the future. <laughs> I mean, that was our main job, going from community to community, taking groups out in the forest and f identifying and learning how to harvest and process and make all these different types of medicines. So can't do that anymore, though. So maybe in the future. Why do you think Western medicine doesn't seem receptive to indigenous natural means of medicine? Um... I mean, honestly, I think it's just as simple as uh, the business bias that the industry is subject to. Um, I mean, that's that's very clear. Um, and uh, um, yeah, just understanding that it, it is Western medicine's uh, job to be able to, one of its major jobs, one of the gifts that it has as uh, as an institution is to be able to give someone the opportunity to live with chronic disease for as long as possible. That's obviously one of their greatest forms of revenue as well. And if you um, remove the chronic disease or prevent the chronic disease, uh, you're removing or preventing one of the greatest forms of revenue. And so uh, it could be as simple as that. Um, but also, I think that there is just simply as like as well, simply a lack of education. There's not so many uh, um, Western medicine practitioners that are taught or told or given the opportunity to understand that plant medicine is is a legitimate practice. And actually, the whole Western medicine itself kind of. A lot of it comes from plants anyways and it's in it th these drugs are an attempt to do what these plants are doing and more often than not are not even able to do what the plant is doing only parts of it like uh like cyclooxygenase inhibition we you know we have uh cox enzymes that are overproduced in fibromyalgia or or like upon infection um and we have cox2 inhibitors like ibuprofen and naproxen and things like that but we don't have a cox1 inhibitor but you look in the natural world uh, there's a lot of, you know, 
COX-1 inhibitors. So, and COX-2. So, and they both, do, they uh, every plant that uh, uh, we use in this particular form of pain management is going to have both COX-1 and COX-2, not just COX-2. And so much greater opportunity or ability to control that type of pain, those kind of aches. Um, and so, uh, yeah, just kind of understanding those ideas, I think opens up the, the mindset to say, huh, I wonder, we should learn about this a little bit more. So yeah, it's like lack of education, I guess. Um, lack of education may be driven by the business bias. Anyways, um, <clears throat> here's number 12 here is what are the key points you would like healthcare students to know about traditional medicine? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just uh, saying, uh, saying the same thing again, but um, we do this quite often. Like I spend a lot of time with uh, now some the medical students being pumped out of there and different sort of healthcare professional generating institutions. And I have so much fun. I get a lot of time to think about this question. And I think that it's, yeah, just understanding that the origins of medicine is in plants and uh, when we are able to access the source of where all of these drugs come from, we're able to offer uh, a, a, a more total health care. And, um, and, and uh, I mean, that's probably single, the single, one of the most single biggest influential, most influential things that a healthcare student is probably able to experience or understand. Um, that and as well, like the importance or the, the understanding too that medicine is one aspect of our culture. Um, and it was one aspect of our culture and the Anishinaabe culture that we were told to remember. Not necessarily practice all the time, but to remember and understand and make sure your children know and understand. Um not necessarily something that was practiced all day, every day, just constantly slamming medicine and, and like, it wasn't just, uh, we were not completely in, enveloped by it, but, it, but, but told to remember, um, which is interesting, but it's one, one part of our culture and to, to, to work with the community, to try and get sick people healthy again, understanding you know, the role that exercise and uh, diet and nutrition, uh, temperature extremes like heat stress and cold stress, so like sweat lodges and uh, winter activities. Uh, I mean, uh, we were always known for wearing minimal clothing throughout the winter um, to experience the cold and not hide from it. And, uh, and there's tremendous health benefit to that. Uh, massive journeys that we would go on um, to go to different gatherings, you know, hundreds of kilometers away, um, walking all day, every day for, for weeks out of the year uh, to gather. Um, these l engagement and long form endurance exercise, uh, these are all super important parts of our culture that um, would be different coming out of the mouth of a physician to be able to, in, to, to be encouraging other parts of our culture as well uh, as uh, the medicine. So I think probably those are, would be two of what I would think uh, key points that healthcare students should, under, should, should have a fair understanding of. Um, uh, uh, are there any dangerous poisonous plants that reveal shapes and characteristics like the one you shared in your presentation? Uh, everything is dangerous. <laughs> everything is dangerous. Um, the difference between medicine and poison is the dose. And um, we're just lucky that in our part of the world, uh, most of the medicine that we have here, um, that upper tolerable intake, like I always tell everybody, that the upper tolerable intake of so much of our medicine is 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 going to be so high that you would probably die of an electrolyte imbalance before you know the toxic effects of those plant chemicals were able to cause uh, anything more than a bellyache. And so, um, 
uh, there, the, everything can be dangerous. Uh, the difference between medicine and poison is the dose. Another really cool um, and very, very consistent, and I know I'm talking with probably a bunch of nerds too, so um, understand that this is coming from a, from a, a place that is well-researched, but that answer to that question is kind of embedded into the plant itself. When a plant tastes like garbage and your mouth just wants to throw it all, all over the wall the second it touches your face, um, the chances are is that you don't need that much of it <laughs> uh, the, and that you're not supposed to drink that much. But a medicine that just tastes like cinnamon heaven, a, a medicine that that just falls down your throat or actually makes you feel like you want to drink more as soon as that is as soon as you swallow it your mouth is like put more in um the these kinds of plants are uh are are telling you that they're very safe to drink and you can you can have a lot like the scouring rush the sweet fern the you know some of these ones that we talked about some of the dangerous or what you would we would consider more poisonous uh not that they're more poisonous it's just easier to access the poisonous potential is like bloodroot and things like that it, it tastes so bad like you're not going to like it and it's gonna it's gonna be hard to get down anyway and so um never force anything and it should always taste good that's a pretty good rule um of course again like the answer to this is technically not what i'm saying it's you got to learn about each one um, and, and this is, uh, not a presentation that's designed to teach how to do it, um, and then to go out and do it and then to understand all these different medicines completely uh, It's probably hundreds of hours of learning for each species. Um, and of which I, I really enjoy providing a few here and there. Um, but, uh, uh, but yeah, the key to this is an education um, and that uh, the, the more you know, the more comfortable you're going to feel and uh, the more experiences you have, the, yeah, you're, you're, you'll be more comfortable. Um, so again, that's, that's education. From uh, Sa Sally Ann Patch, Ojibwe horse caregiver. I'm interested in the medicine for horses and I would appreciate it. Any information for contacting a knowledge keeper? Um, sweet. You know what? I, um, we'll just have to get in contact directly. There's a lot there. So it's called wood betony, pedicularis canadensis. It's got a yellow flower. So it's, it's a parasitic plant. It's, so it can grow anywhere. Um, a lot of people are able to find it all over. Um, but, um, But yeah, I wouldn't purchase it online. Um, but I'll send you some. If because uh, um, it's it's really amazing for the horses. Yeah, so I think I I must have talked about that. I forget. <laughs> uh, but that's a really really amazing story. I have uh, I have a whole series that I started on our Patreon of uh, um, sessions where. We are we dive into these these relationships between plants and creatures that they have special connections to, uh, and this horse and Nadwanak, uh, the horse and Wood Betney was one that I that I really enjoy speaking about. But yeah, there's plant creature connections with horses, with uh, bears and fish and bugs and uh, deer and moose and everything it's really really incredible um but uh but yeah we'll have to keep in touch there so i could send you some <laughs> um how does your knowledge and practice integrate into the roadmap on wellness in terms of traditional medicine what how do i read that how does your knowledge and practice integrate into the roadmap of on wellness in terms of traditional medicine. Man, I don't know if it's just uh, if it's the food poisoning. 
because I've had that for the last five days. <laughs> or uh, if I, I don't understand, how does your knowledge and practice integrate into the roadmap of wellness in terms of traditional medicine? Um, I don't, maybe I can understand what you're what that question is saying <laughs> um but how does my knowledge and practice like medicinal knowledge uh kind of integrate into the roadmap of wellness um you know what like i'm st figuring that out <laughs> like i said i had like free food poisoning for the past five days and you know, you're supposed to go in to the hospital there day three or whatever. Um, actually, this is day four. Um, but rather than going to the hospital, you know, COVID times, I went to the hospital. So I was like fever and real bad, like uh, 39 and a half, probably kissing 40 every now and then, but. I didn't want to take my temperature, so uh, it was it was really really bad. It was really really uncomfortable for the first two days, uh, and then on the third day, yesterday, I yeah, so this day four, yesterday, I uh, I knew that you know this is about the time when I should go to the hospital. There's there's no relief. I was like testing out brat diet and just having some Tylenol and resting it up and see if I could fight it on my own and couldn't. So. Uh, Rather than going to the hospital, though, I had some of the sweet fern yesterday at about one. And uh, every hour, I checked my temperature and it slowly kept coming back down uh, to the point where it was below 37 now since uh, since yesterday, yesterday evening. Um, and uh, the sweet fern, yeah, just pulled me right out of her right away. <laughs> And then everybody's kind of like, well, how come you just wouldn't do that on day one? And um, I don't know. I really like experimenting. Uh, this was probably one of the more uncomfortable experimentations that I've that I've ever done. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to see, you know, if I could do it myself. And I have the medicine there. And so when I need it, I use it. Yesterday I used it and it it did what it was supposed to do really fast like I had relief in about 20 minutes after after I started drinking the tea the amount of nausea and kind of knots in my belly that I had immediately started to go away so same with the headache you know the food poisoning headache um that that really started to subside immediately it was really cool um but yeah, right now, my, I use my knowledge to experiment so that I can get more knowledge, <laughs> more experience. Um, uh, but for for everybody, I think that, yeah, this is just, uh, this knowledge is practiced uh, as, a, as a way of life. It's an understanding that, that we uh, should have and uh, engage with on a regular basis to give us the opportunity to live the life that, you know, this land and this knowledge is able to provide for us. Uh, I'm not, I'm not a good life. And I think that, uh, um, that it's something that, that really needs to be remembered and understood. So I keep saying education. I don't say integration. I don't say, um, I'm not given no real action words yet because we're still in that education phase. We need to learn about it first. <laughs> uh, if we if we were at it in integrative phases, uh, maybe this presentation would look a little bit different. Uh, but we need to learn and recapture and remember uh, and then talk about integration. And uh, I think we're very young into the learning process right now. And, uh, and yeah, opportunities like this to be able to spend time with folks like you, to be able to 
offer the encouragement and motivation and inspiration to be able to begin that education journey yourself right now to know that this is a valid or legitimate experience uh, uh, and then to start that journey yeah is uh, it's a really amazing opportunity so uh, that's the end of the questions so I gotta get back to drinking my tea <laughs> I'm glad I finally got this done. Uh, hopefully this gets uh slap on the website soon and so you could get your questions answered. I'm really thankful for these opportunities. Uh I can't wait to hang out again. Maybe round two, we'll see. Uh but uh for now, chumigwech. Bama, we'll see you guys later. <laughs>